May the words of my mouth and, med and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Ears to hear, the mouth to speak. Our gospel lesson presents a very curious instance of healing in the ministry of our Lord. The miracles our Lord performed recorded in the gospels were more than just mere instances of helping people with the restoration of their health. They were, moreover, what Scripture calls signs. Signs are instances of God's intervention designed to teach us spiritual truth, which transcends our limited understanding of reality. Being bound as we are by the limits of space, matter and time there is much of the spiritual world we are incapable of knowing unless the lord reveals it to us born into a fallen world and at the end of a long process of decay and departure from truth we are naturally handicapped in our understanding of truth and reality because we are by nature, alienated from God, the source of all life and truth. As humans turn their backs to God's revelation, we sink deeper and deeper into a dark cavern where deception reigns and nothing is necessarily what it appears to be. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He came with the power of heaven to bring light into a darkened world. The light of the world came to bring life and light to every man. His revelation required miracles and signs by which the world will come to know that his mission and identity were more than extraordinary occurrences of human self-improvement, but were a divine intervention coming from above by which God became man to redeem and restore the world for his own glory. Signs are then miracles with a message, miracles which represent important spiritual truth and which have implications we must learn to understand. Our lesson today features one of these miraculous signs. In Mark chapter 7, verse 31, we read, And again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, Jesus came into the Sea of Galilee, through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And they bring unto him one that was dead, and had an impediment in his speech, and they beseeched him to put his hand upon him. And Jesus took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears, and he spit and touched his tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighed and said unto him, Ephatha, that is, be open. And straight away his ear was opened, and the string of his tongue was loose, and he spake again. This story of the gospel is singular among the many miracles our Lord did. It features prominently the gifts of hearing and speech by highlighting the effects of sin and how Jesus can overcome them in his person and by his commandments. 
the effects of sin upon our lives are illustrated by the way sickness affects our bodies and impairs our senses of hearing and speech. The meaning of the sign points out the importance of these two interrelated gifts. To be able to speak, we must be able to listen. And listening with attention is a necessary condition for speaking with truth, with understanding. The ear and the tongue are deeply related to each other and are important to the life also. Faith comes through hearing and it is necessary, it necess the necessary condition for confessing audibly what our hearts have come to know through hearing. We were created in God's image. And this affects us at every level of our existence, including our body and its faculties. In Psalm 94, verse 5, we read, The wicked break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine inheritance. They slay the widow and the stranger, and murder the fatherless. Yet, they say, the Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. Understand, ye brutish among the people, and ye fools, when will ye be wise? He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? He that chastises the heathen, shall not he correct? He that teacheth man knowledge shall not he know. The sound is clear and straightforward. The fact that we possess the ability to hear, see, correct, teach, and know is direct evidence of the fact that God the creator of all these marvelous gifts must himself be able to exercise them and control them according to his divine will. In other words, our ability to see, listen, speak, and learn is directly related to our spiritual constitution as creatures made in God's image and depends upon him for its proper use. When God created the world, there was no sickness or death. Everything was very good. Had there been no sin, there will be no blindness and no deafness and not muteness. But these all change after the fall, everything became corrupted, and the material world began to exhibit visible signs of its spiritual corruption and decadence and alienation from the God of life. Things stopped working as they should. Birth, birthing became pain, a painful process. Flowers developed thorns and thistles, and work became taxing and vexing. Our senses also became less than they were originally designed to be. Our eyes, which are symbols of our spiritual vision, became darkened. Our intelligence began to serve as an instrument to cover our chain with excuses, instead of leading us to the knowledge of God, which is the beginning of an end of all wisdom. Shame and fear clouded our judgment and further alienated us from God and one another. Our ears became corrupted. We began to listen and interpret the information we heard driven by our lust. And, we, and so we developed itching ears 
ears inclined to fables and resisting the truth. And so the light in us becomes more and more darkness and we don't even notice it because that darkness is the only light we know. We become blind even to our own blindness. All the time believing that we have a clear vision and love the truth. Our speech became corrupted. We uttered senseless speech, expressing falsehoods and ungrounded opinions. We began to use our speech to disguise our plans and intentions with lies and evasions and the exaltation of the creature over and against the Creator. And finally, and more importantly, our education was corrupted. Instead of learning and teaching and preserving from one generation to the next the truth revealed by God from the beginning, fables and human traditions were accumulated and came to substitute the knowledge of God as revealed by God. Technological achievements became instruments for rebellion and self-exaltation of the creature against the Creator. The worship of God became the worship of the creature as humanity became more and more enslaved to the serpent, whose goal from the beginning was to deceive us, enslave us, and destroy us. But the Lord sent Jesus into the world to undo the works of the devil and to release humanity from sin and all its consequences. And this is then what signs like the one we heard today serves to illustrate and teach us. It reveals that the word of Jesus, the command of the Lord, is sovereign over the fall and all its effects. Jesus put his fingers upon this man's ears and he touched his thumb with his own speed. These are instances of direct, physical, and personal contact. And then while doing this, he raised his eyes to heaven and commanded the man to be open. And what happened? Those powers that had been previously bounded became unloosed. The man could listen. The man could speak because Jesus opened his ears and unloosed his tongue. Could it be any more clear? Who is the only one who can deliver us from our fallen condition and restore creation to his designed purpose? Could it be any clearer that Jesus alone can guide us in the way that we should live as God designed? The Lord warned us that before his coming, there would come many false messiahs, many false teachers, and that they would be successful in deceiving multitudes of people. These messiahs and false teachers have come, and these multitudes have been deceived, and the world lives today in darkness and confusion. Truth is dismissed as personal opinion, while lies are promoted and disseminated as science. And woe unto anyone who dares declare in public how the emperor has no clothes. Deception and confusion prevail over the, over the land. But this is not the end of the gospel. All these false messiahs, all these false teachers will eventually be exposed and the light of truth will triumph and reign forever. In the meanwhile, the faithful must always bear in mind the commandment of the gospel and how it is the only answer to the predicament of the human condition 
in each and every circumstance. Not how our gospel account ends. Then the people marvel because they saw the messianic signs which Jesus did, but know that they had little understanding of the implications of what they were seeing. For them, it was just a miracle to marvel at and to admire as the works of a prophet who had done all things right, and maybe that he could be the Messiah. But there was more to this sign. Jesus commanded them not to share this miracle with anyone. But he says, and he charged them that they should tell no man. This miracle had been performed in the region of Galilee during the early stages of the Lord's ministry. At the time, Jesus tried to keep as low a profile as possible for him to have enough time to prepare his disciples before the authorities came down against him, as he knew it would happen. And indeed it happened, as his fame grew enough in Jerusalem to become a threat to the powers that be. So his strategy was to keep as low a profile as possible until the end and not to reveal his identity and mission to anyone unless they had become his disciples first. But most of the people did not understand any of this. They wanted a Messiah now and so they could not contain their excitement seeing some of the signs fulfilled and went against his clear orders the orders of that very messiah they wanted jesus to be so you see the contradiction the signs revealed jesus was the messiah and the lord but if he is the messiah and lord then we must follow his instructions and do as he tells us to do and not as we please or as we think is right the gospel is not only for us to become excited and do whatever we think is right the gospel is for us to believe and follow in obedience to Christ as Lord through all circumstances until the end we come to the Lord's table to obey the commandment of Christ to all who believe in Him, confessing our sins and recommitting our lives to His service, pleading with Him that in His mercy He would do to us what He did to this man, that He would command our ears and our mouth to be open, open to the truth, to proclaim his praises and teach his truth and our minds and hearts open to know love and practice the gospel before a world mired in confusion until the Lord returns to fulfill his promise establishing his eternal kingdom and rewarding each one according to his works. To him be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who art always more ready to hear than we to pray, and art one to give more than either we desire or deserve, who down upon us the abundance of thy mercy, for giving us those things whereof our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask, but through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen.